Welcome back, everybody. So this is going to be our fourth and final class of the Bhagavad Gita study. And today we're going to be looking at the concept of Bhakti Yoga and specifically reference to chapter 12 of the Bhagavad Gita. And let's just double check a couple of things that everybody is on mute. And uh, Craig, you had some things that you wanted to share with us right from the start. Yeah, I wanted to read, uh, Leon had a nice question last week um, about uh, impersonal aspects of Buddhism and how it would relate it in relationship to what Krishna was saying. So I found a, an interesting commentary by uh, Srila Bhaktivinoda Takura, which is one of the preeminent sages in the Vaishnava lineage. And it's a, it's a short commentary. Um, and he says, and so I, I figured I would read it because it, it does give an insight into how they would answer this question. Um, and it says uh, the, the commentary is, is hidden, kind of like nestled within the actual Bhagavad Gita. And it says, the Lord's statement, quote, the worshipers of impersonal Brahman certainly also reach me, must not be misconstrued to mean that the impersonalist or the Mayavadis are on an equal footing with the devotionists or Vaishnavas. The clue to how the impersonalist can also reach Krishna has been given in some of my other writings called the Sri Gita. And I refer to a person attains liberation from the mundane plane by following the path of selfless service up to the stage of meditation as described in the first six chapters of the Gita. Then he or she may undergo great difficulty in searching for the Lord on the path of impersonalism. But when he or she progresses to the stage of dedicating themselves to perform welfare or service to others, he may get a slim chance to render service to a pure devotee. For example, if one engages in the general public welfare work of opening or running a hospital, if some service is even unknowingly rendered to a Vaishnava, one's devotional merit begins. By association with the devotee, one develops faith in the original, divine, personal form of the Lord and automatically abandons the attempt of attaining to the impersonal Brahman. Having become faithful to the path of devotion, one takes shelter in a bona fide guru or sampradaya, engages in the devotional practices based on hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, and progresses on the path back to home, back to Godhead. Um, to consider that the Lord has taken the personal and impersonal aspects to be equal is a mistake very commonly committed. Um, it, it says, then he kind of finishes and says, the Lord has clearly replied that the personalist are superior to the impersonalist. However, the impersonalists are, are also given a chance to reach him because without him, no ultimate goal exists. Without coming to the path of devotion or without coming to bhakti, which was what we'll talk today, the worshipers of the impersonal Brahman will reach that Brahman. But they have to remember that this Brahman is the dazzling effulgence of the divine form of Lord Sri Krishna. And so that's a really key idea. They would often say, oh, yes, this, this Brahman, this impersonal void does exist, but that's just the effulgence from Krishna. That's just the rays of the sun. We're trying to take you to the actual sun. And so they'll, they'll, you'll often hear them say that, oh, yes, absolutely. Brahman does exist, the impersonal void does exist, but that's just the, the, the rays, that's just kind of like the glare of your eyes when you, when you gaze at Krishna. So don't, don't stop there. So, that's, so I thought you might appreciate that. That's kind of what you, you'll, you'll often see almost every answer is kind of based on that idea. That was really beautiful. I enjoyed that too. Yeah, it sets us up for what we're going to talk about today. Absolutely. So in chapter 12, we're looking at the concept of yogic science and bhakti yoga in particular. So I thought first we would look at what is this word, this term, this technique of bhakti, just from a general overall view. So when we look at bhakti, we see the breakdown of the word bhaj, B-H-A-J, and that can be defined in some settings as to adore or worship God. And some people view bhakti as loving for love's sake or surrendering to the divine. But there's a lot of different forms of bhakti. And I wanted to just take a look at nine different types of sadhana that are often referred to. So one form would be 
Shvarana, make sure I pronounce everything correctly, which is listening to scriptural stories. Then there's a form called Kirtana or Kirtan, which would be considered praising, singing, usually a call response group type setting singing. And Shmarana is considered a form of bhakti to remember or fix the mind onto um, worship. Then we have Pada Sevana, which is considered rendering service or seva. Arkana, which is worshiping an image or vandana, paying homage. And dhasya, which is servitude. Sak Hmm, say this correctly, Sakya, which is friendship, or the ninth Atma Nivedana, the complete surrender of oneself. So I thought it was really nice to begin framing this by looking at that. When I was looking through everything as well, I wanted to go backwards a little bit and read just seven 16, so chapter 7, verse 16, that states, those who seek shelter in me, O Arjuna, are four types. So there's four types of people who seek shelter. Those who are in distress, those who seek understanding, those who seek power, and those who are already wise. And we can look at it in a little bit different way. One reason why we do bhakti is because something's wrong and we're maybe asking for it to be fixed or we're asking for shelter, sharanam. Some are for the sake of an intellectual curiosity or seeking. And the other third would be to seek rewards, boons, see these, some people might say. And then the fourth would be purely for the sake of pure love. So I really liked that framing before we go into the subjects of today in chapter 12. Um, Craig, do you have commentary on just these concepts before we move into the main readings? Yeah, I mean, those are very important to, to bring up. That's, those are kind of the, all the tools of, of typical Vaishnava sadhana would be that someone would pick one of those things as their path of bhakti. And obviously, you know, we would see, um, in you know, growing up, that's within the Krishna movement, the Ishkan movement, the, the Kirtans were very popular, right? The call and the response, that was very popular. And most of the teachers that I had from from India, the the the, the deepest aspect that we would work with was the smarana or the or the memory, was that you would ha you would have a certain amount of materials that you had memorized, and they were they were constantly alive in your mind, and then that would literally start to change the background of your entire mind space. Yeah, and, and that's the, even the Smarana is something I talk about a lot because Smarana is, is, is a big issue within yogic psychology because, it, or any psychology, we always have to look about what's, what are you predominantly thinking about? You know, if someone is predominantly looping in their mind things that make them sad, then they're going to be sad. If someone is constantly revolving in their mind horrible images from the news, and they're going to be, their nervous system is going to be very vitiated. And so smarana and is a very healing practice too. And so, and, and of course, the practice of smarana or, or memory or a remembrance was of course clearly connected to literature, right? They were reading the literature and they were, they were memorizing or they were remembering the stories or they were listening. They were listening to stories or listening to something and then keeping in their mind. So I think that these things are very important for people to look at. There's all these different pathways of bhakti, but what we constantly remember, what we constantly think about, um, what can transform our entire perception of our karma. Um, and on that same subject, Smarana, would you say, where would Ajapa Japa fit into that? Would that be considered similar or something a little bit different? Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you could have Smarana on mantra. You know, someone would be, you know, actually get to the point where they were, they had just memorized the mantras and they were, and the mantra was, they were cons consistently looping the mantra in their mind until at some point there was enough Shakti in that mantra to where it just took on a life of its own. 
and then and that but and that's kind of what they were hoping right the tantric practitioner was doing extensive ritual work with the mantras and hoping that they would awaken that mantra and the mantra would just be alive and then just kind of, and just kind of possess them and then when that happened then they would they would achieve the cities of whoever they were worshiping or a vision of their ishta devata um, you know, something which can, which would radically shift their perception of their spiritual practice and reality. Nice. Yeah, I hadn't um, correlated those two before until you mentioned it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. One of the practices that my guru in India, Adi Shakti Ma, has us do is, you know, the guru mantra, and she wants it just repeated and repeated yeah. and repeated. So and many times, you know, when we look at these, why are we doing these different activities and particularly if I feel mentally vitiated something is upsetting me I'm not feeling well um, something has agitated me I try to always attempt to go back to that that repetition that remembering yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of start pressing out and deleting away what else my mind has fixed on not not yes. cover it up or conceal it but to transform it into something else and almost an offering of it into the light of that mantra to be reprogrammed almost yeah there's there's a concept in uh coaching and behavioral change therapy which which sometimes people use and they'll call it they'll call it crowding out therapy and basically what they do is they just they bring in a lot you know enough positive healthy behavior that there's literally no room for the bad behavior or they'll fill their plate with so much good food that there's literally no room for the bad food. Um, and so that hence the crowding out idea, but for many people that really does work, uh, it just depends on their disposition, but that's the same idea, right? Is it the more thought we just start to have more thoughts about spiritual subjects and eventually we, there's just no room for the actual worries or depressions or anxieties uh, or things that we might've gone back to and looped before. Obviously Smarana, and these kind of things have great implications for things like PTSD, where people are just looping things in their mind, um, no, and no matter what, and they can't break out of that loop. And that's where a lot of the yoga practices can be brought in and, and kind of integrative care and really help that way. Yeah, tremendously powerful. <laughs> All right, let's take a look here at um, the main text from chapter 12. So I'll cover 12, one through 12, four first. Arjuna said, between those who worship you with steadfast devotion and those who concentrate on the absolute, which is better versed in yoga science? The blessed Lord answered, those who with minds fixed on me are ever united to me in pure devotion are in my eyes the best versed in yoga. Those, however, who aspire to the indestructible, the indescribable, the unmanifested, the all-pervading, the incomprehensible, the immutable above all vibration, who have subjugated the senses, are even-minded and devote themselves to the well-being of all, verily they to attain me. Can you talk on just this Absolutely. And, and then quickly on my screen, I'm not seeing the actual verses uh, or the slides aren't working on my screen. So I, I want to be sure everybody else has that on theirs as well, too. I'm still kind of stuck on a on the Bhakti Yoga Chapter 12 screen. Is there, can, if everybody else has seen it, that's, that, that's fine for me. Well, I, I just want to be sure everybody else is okay. Yeah, the, these verses are interesting because, I mean, this these verses are kind of the in many ways, kind of the culmination of what Krishna is trying to teach throughout the entire Gita. Um, and he's kind of saying like all those people who are able to practice yoga and control their senses with their mind is calm. Um, they've dedicated their life to helping others and who also worship all the, all everything I've been talking about, all the inconceivable ways that everything is connected. All those people, anyone who does that, um, they will be able to reach me. And that's the thing. And so it's, it's, it's a very beautiful idea. It's, it's basically saying it always goes back to one of the things I love so much about this is there's a consistent, there's a consistent reminder of dedicated to helping everyone. And there's always this idea of seva there where people are just constantly, constantly um, helping everyone um, 
you know, how, how they're doing and, and no matter what they're on their path. And so that it's a good thing to always kind of orbit us back to our yoga practice instead of getting so self-absorbed in your own yoga practice. We should always remember that are we helping all living beings as much as we can. And of course, that ties back to the previous things we talked about that Krishna was saying, I'm everywhere. I'm, I'm in every part of the universe. I'm in the parts I'm in being, I'm in non-being, I'm inside of you, I'm inside of everyone else. So it's just, it's a very radical teaching of, of true spiritual equality, um, which I think is something which is not talked about enough when people discuss the Gita. That's a really good point. Really good point. Um, before we go on, give me just a second. Let me do a little bit of a technical tweak. Oh, sure. Absolutely. No problem. And I think that's an important idea for people to think about um, is that people can get lost really quickly into what am I supposed to do? All these things are, set, you know, we're talking about all these different paths. What am I really supposed to do? Um, but as long as we always consistently remember that, yes, we should have a personal practice, but along the way of this spiritual journey, as we're doing our personal practice, we should still be really striving to help others. Um, that becomes very, a very important concept to always remind ourselves. And then you're helping others in any way that you can based on your own dharma. I just like, you know, Peyton and I, Peyton has mentioned many times in the past, like, you know, cooking for people or creating food is a very healing practice is something where you offer someone nutritious food and healing practices and that could be offered up to Krishna and to the greater good and then then, then the food becomes prasad it becomes literally healing food um, and that's something that's a very ancient Vedic practice I'll actually have a section on that in the new tantric physics I was actually writing it last night on that on that subject of you know whatever our mind space is while we're eating in many ways the whatever the our mind space is where when we're eating is more important in many ways than the exterior space. Because you know, you could sit in this beautiful restaurant, you could sit in a beautiful garden and eating a beautiful meal and you're just like angry or you're sad or you're depressed and that doesn't matter. But if you're internally calm and your mind's internally calm and you're offering everything with an attitude of gratitude and reverence, um, then no matter where you're sitting, you have this inner sanctuary within you. Uh, and, and then as personally, and if you're preparing food, then that goes into the food. If you're helping anyone, then all this kind of radiates out. So I think that's a big part of bhakti is that we're worshiping, but we're also worshiping through service, through helping other people. We're worshiping through trying to do everything that we do the best we can to help others and for everyone else to kind of get that radiance too. That's a really important concept, and I think we talked about this previously in the Healing Digestion series we did, and, you know, some people become so sensitive to the food that they can take, they, they don't taste with their tongue, but they perceive through their subtle channels if the food has been prepared by somebody who is in a bad mental state, and it's right. with a bad mental state, and sometimes you really have to kind of work to neutralize that. And I'm yes. Glad brought that up about bhakti being even in food and offering prasad as well. Absolutely. How are we doing technologically now? Do you see the 12.1 and 12.4 on your screens? On mine, it's really small. I can see it now, but it's like super small. And on the, like on the left is like a selection of other ones. So maybe enlarge it a bit. just one more second and i think for me also too another concept which i'm glad leon asked that question that he asked that looks good to me right now i can see that's good um, thank you for your patience um but i think you know this idea of the impersonal aspect of krishna called brahman and and that we as we mentioned earlier that that's like the radiance of krishna that radiates out once again, it kind of ties back to that concept of that everything is connected, that everyone's on every, every angle we try to penetrate into this path of bhakti is going to take us home, according to their words, back to Godhead or back to home. 
it just depends on how long it's going to take, but that's okay. Um, you know, sometimes uh, I enjoy longer trips than others. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It, it, sometimes I want a quicker trip. Sometimes I'm fine. So I think that's another thing. It, it, so many of these concepts, I, I want people to understand that it should start to bring them a great sense of calmness, that they don't have to rush, that there's, there's not a lot of anxiety, that they're not doing something right, that, that, that someone else, you know, that there's so many different ways they can approach it that could be their own path. Um, and then um, they should approach whatever, whatever comes in front of their path. They should see it as some kind of gift and they should honor that. <clears throat> I'm to bring that up actually, because I've encountered that many times on my own journey. Of mm -hmm. feeling like, oh, I'm not doing it right. I'm not doing it well enough. I'm not doing it um, properly, or maybe I'm doing it offensively or, you know, all these different thoughts come into mind and then you want to kind of hurry up and perfect it and, and you, you lose the, the deliciousness in it when you have that, that rush or that fear or that concern. Right. One thing that one of my other teachers had taught me is she said, just do it like a child, you know, mm -hmm. a parent is not going to, I mean, uh, kind parent is not going to reject a picture that a child makes that you know it's with a broken crayon and it's outside the lines and scribbled that the when it's done with purity it's still cherished and loved and so even if it's not perfect go ahead and keep doing it and just keep progressing steadily without that fear taking away from the beautiful process Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, I, th well, I often think about it too. Like in a, I mean, I often I see due to my kind of lifetime of practice and systems of kung fu, which take you know so many long years of devotion to get to the higher levels. There's so many analogies, but you know, one of the best analogies of it that I can always remember is as you as you refine your ability to do kung fu, and it gets more subtle and more subtle, and so you're having more and more intense practice you'll often be doing things and they feel really good. You feel like you're doing the technique really good and you have reached a certain level of skill. You know, you might be better than a large amount of the other people in the class, but when you're with the highest level practitioner and you're thinking you're doing, you think you're doing really well. And then at some point the highest, the, the Sifu or the, whoever's the higher teacher says, okay, now we're really going to start doing something. I've just kind of been letting you do that just to get a feel for this just so you can start to get a feel for the movements and feel for everything. And I haven't been really pointing out any of your, any of your problems, but now I'm going to start pointing out some of the problems. And, and then you're thinking, well, shit, I thought I was really good that whole time. It felt really good to me. And then you're, and so then he's saying, well, no, there was like tons of holes there, but you just can't see that yet. So now here I am to help you. And then you would go, okay. And then it's beautiful. Then you continue. It's like many of this relationship, Krishna is often like that too. Krishna is saying like, listen, I'm going to let you, do as many of these things because it's just something you need to do. You need to feel this. You need to feel what it feels like to do some of these practices, to get a feel for it, just to get, to go through the motions and understand things. And then eventually you'll start to refine it. Um, that's a, that's an important part of the process. Yeah. And you know, you bring that up and there's one other thing that I want to share on an experience personal level. The first time I went to India and was conversing and meeting with experiencing my guru, she said, you know, okay, you know, this is great, do your bhakti, etc. And then two years later, I went back and she said, what happened? And I said, what do, you, what do you mean what happened? I've really been working very hard on this. And she said, but last time you were here, you were beside yourself like a child. And you did it with such purity of a child. And now it's become constrained and more technical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for me, I was like, wow, I've been working so hard to try yeah. to perfect it in her heart and in her mind and in her practice. She said, go back to doing it with the innocence and purity of a child. And I was like, okay. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a good point. So, you know, depending on what we're doing, we can look at it from different aspects. So let's look at 12.5 and 12, 6 through 8. Those who make the unmanifested their primary goal make the path more difficult for themselves. 
arduous is the path for embodied beings. I read that and I kind of scratched my head and I thought, I'm just going to pause right there for a moment. Those yeah. make the unmanifested their primary goal make the path more difficult for themselves. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what Leon and I were discussing. The yeah. idea that if someone was going to try to approach something that with, with breaking away all descriptions of it to literally kind of start to distill away everything into this shunyata or void or nothingness, it can be done, but it's very difficult. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to do that. And it's a hard path for someone who's living in the fit. And for, that's what a really good translation for embodied beings, because our consciousness while we're embodied in the flesh has a much different perspective than if it's a consciousness where we're disembodied somewhere else. And then the, the, the void or the expansion is, it has a whole different perspective. Um, and it's, it's very similar to, like I said, you know, when I was in Tibet versus when I was in India, you know, I could clearly see just the entire geography and the environment, both psychically and terrestrially, was so vastly different that it dramatically influenced their expression of their yogic practices. Um, and that made, it made a lot of sense. So, so then 12, 6 through 12, 8, for those who venerate me only, offering to me all their actions, their minds concentrated on me by yoga practice, and their hearts' feelings uplifted to me in devotion. Such devotees I rescue from the ocean of mortality. Immerse your consciousness in me alone. Direct all your discrimination towards finding me beyond any doubt. Then you shall become one with me. And that's a beautiful idea that, you know, one of the things I've often liked about this one where he says, you know, concentrate on just finding me. Like, and, and what that essentially means is like, find me in everything you do. Look for me in every single thing you do. Look for me in every person you meet, every, every piece of food you eat, every book you read. Look for how I'm there. How am I speaking to you? And so that's, it's kind of like discovering Agni hidden in everything. You know, we know that Agni is literally hidden in every piece of matter. There's a type of Agni there. Um, and so that's kind of what he's saying. And then that's also, too, with that one there, he's kind of kind of combining, you know, yogic practices with bhakti together. Seems to be what he's saying here is a better practice. You know, if, if you have all of your discrimination, your mind, all the yogic practices, and your heart's feelings are uplifted, so that means bhakti or emotions, that that combination is better than one or the other. Um, and we can see that a lot. A lot of people who have only bhakti, they, they get, they can, they have a tendency. They could fall into this type of emotionalism, this almost kind of like sentimentalism. And then people who are only into the practices, and they get very academic or very heady or very cerebral. But if you have both, there's a, there's kind of a balancing act that goes on there. It's a softening back and forth. And so that's kind of hinted at in this verse that if you have both that there's always going to be this kind of presence which is helping you in your life as you kind of cross uh, the ocean of mortality. Yeah, and, you know, you brought up a, a statement that what it reminded me of and I wanted to bring into it is that a lot of times people only do bhakti when they are feeling devotional and you were yeah. supposed to look for god in everything yes but i think that we also need to remember and to remind ourselves to look for that in the difficult times too yes for divinity in the difficulties to look for divinity in the pain and to see where we can extract it in those moments as well yeah it's very important and that's that's one of the teachings that Bhagavad Gita has become a perennial teaching is that it's always something we can take into any situation, any worldly situation and see like, okay, where can I find the divinity in this? Where can I define the divinity in all these areas? Um, you know, something, and, and how can I serve? I mean, those, those two things are essentially, once again, if people are looking to how they can help others and how they can search for the divinity in others, that alone um, is, is not only very healing, it's a fundamental teaching of this system. 
So 12.9 through 12.11, O Dhanajaya or Arjuna, if you cannot absorb your thoughts in the contemplation of me, then practice the techniques of yoga intended to help develop concentration. If, however, you find yoga practice too difficult, then perform every action in the thought of me. By this means, too, shall you achieve final success. But if even while active you cannot think of me, then give me your intentions, ever striving to discipline your mind, offer to me the fruits of your very, of your every labor. Yeah, and this one is really, one, it's giving basically a, a path here. You know, Krishna is basically saying, if, you're, if you really fix your mind, if you really try to practice yoga, if you really try to practice all the limbs of yoga, then you will reach me. But if for some reason that's just too hard, you just don't understand it, then, then go on the path of bhakti, which is all the things you listed, you know, kirtan, you know, remembrance, remembrance, all these things like that. But if that's even too hard for you, if you can't do those practice, then just try to offer everything you do to me, offer up the work to me. And that alone will help you reach that. So he's basically once again saying like, listen, there's all these pathways you can do. Never feel bad. Like it's, it's kind of what we we're just saying. This verse is kind of what's always influenced me when I talk about this chapter is like that no one should feel like a failure if they can't do something, if they can't, there's always going to be an option with that, um, you know? And so now there's there, this, of course, a lot of this has to do with just one's, you know, dosha or their, or their mental type or their personality type. What are they attracted to? Some people, they might have more of a proclivity to meditation and other ones have to definitely have a more proclivity to ritual and bhakti and others don't understand that, but they, they can offer help and service to other human beings. Uh, and that in any, any one of those angles, they're going to end up to, to, to the destination um, where they want to go, which is a really beautiful idea. It is, you know, and then the, the other question that we'll often ask is what, how do you know if you have final success? Like how do you, right. know if you reach this state? How do you know if you're doing it right? How do you know if you're just, going through the motions, chanting, singing, um, offering, studying, remembering. Like, at what point does a person know, okay, I've reached Krishna? Yeah, I think that a, the, a Vaishnava would, would answer for that would be that, you know, as one practices um, in, in any one of these, these steps here, you know, let's say one was deeply involved in, you know, practicing yogic sadhana, um, then after a while, if they started to notice that more and more teachings were coming their way, or they were giving more and more opportunities to study with other devotees or great teachers, then those are light bulbs going off. The Vaishnavas would say that same thing with bhakti. If they were doing lots of bhakti and they started having more and more doorways open for deeper relationships with devotees or study or other teachings were coming their way. Again, of course, what, what would the modern person say? And they would say, oh, you mean uh, the, a lot of synchronicities are happening, right? They would use like a Carl Jung's term, like, okay, as these synchronicities were little kind of like signs that you're on, you're on this path to individuation, that, that's a, that you should look at that and say, yes, okay. And I think there's some truth to that. I think that as we, we practice, whether someone's doing jnana yoga, bhakti yoga, Raja yoga, uh, uh, what kind of not Raja Guya yoga, but Raja yoga in the sense of, you know, Patanjali, and things like that. Then if someone is doing that, the tapas of their spiritual practice not only starts to purify them and create a momentum, it also creates, it, there, it, two things start to happen. It's, it's, it, you, you have a momentum that starts and then also you have, it creates like a magnet, almost like a, a gravitational pull that the tapas starts to create a certain kind of gravitational pull and it starts to pull things to you that can help you. And then, and then, then you just have to be aware of seeing that and that you have to be, keep your eyes open and say like, okay, I have to be open that there's going to be any, the universe could send anything to me in these most mysterious ways to help me find that. Um, you know, I remember I'll give it, I'll share an example, uh, a very private example. I, rem I think I shared this actually in another talk here. I'm not sure, but I remember one time when I was very young, I, uh, I was, I was very uh, obsessed with 
uh, collecting uh, literature from India, and then I, I wanted a certain edition of Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita because they started to edit it, and the, and it was there was a certain edition in the 1970s that they were that you could was very hard to get anymore. Now you can. Now they've gone back. There was much controversy after Prabhupada died, and they're offering back the older editions. And, and so the, the new editions, there's very controversy. They, they were changing some Sanskrit. You know, there's a lot of, of course, these organizations, once the leader dies, oftentimes they just kind of fall apart. So as a young person, I was obsessed with this older edition. At the time, there was no internet. You couldn't find it. Uh, the temples didn't have it. And so I was like, ah, you know, I thought maybe, you know, in my young, uh, you know, totally confident mind, I thought maybe if I just, you know, do enough mantra that this book will come to me. You know, I thought, you know, if I just, just do enough ritual, it will come to me. And so that was, uh, you know, I must have spent, you know, months and months and months of doing devotional called thing tapas. And then I remember going home <clears throat> one Christmas to uh, visit my parents. And it was a really cold Christmas, not snowy cold in Louisiana, but I, it was, you know, like in the 20s or something. And I remember seeing this homeless man and I was like, oh, that's horrible that there's this homeless man they're cold. And you know, this one, this would have been when I was like 15. So that dates me. I'm 50 now. So now homeless people are more common, sadly, right? You know, back then it wasn't as common. It was, it, you weren't numb to this. And so I was like, that's so sad. And I remember I had just gotten money for Christmas. Uh, Cause as a college student, that's what, you know, as you get, you're, you're getting closer to college, all you want is money. So I was like, Oh, I'm going to give him some money. And I just want to give him everything I have. So I went over to this guy and, and gave him $50 and, and said, I hope, you know, hope you're okay. And he just took it and then, and walked away. And then, then, and then I guess he opened up, you know, he, he realized how much it was and he screamed at me and said, wait, 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 hold on. And he came back and he said, I can't believe you gave me this. All I have, all I have to give you is this. And then he had the 1970 version of the Bhagavad Gita as it is. And I was just like, Oh my God, this is it. You know, it's like, you have no idea how long I've been looking for this book. And he was like, Oh, you can have it. It's yours. You know, and he had probably gotten it from the Hare Krishnas feeding him, you know, because often they'll just offer anyone food. And so that's like a synchronicity, right? Now, at that moment, as a young person, it's like, oh, that's it. This is so, this is how these things work. And, and so then that way, you know, I didn't have a vision of Krishna in my room, right? He didn't just show up and, and, and the, you know, this, you know, the veil parted and I got this message. No, I had to actually get out and engage and, and do things and active and be open to see um, and, and, you know, I was in a very young, innocent person. I wasn't like, oh, if I give this person this money, I'm going to get something, you know. So that, it was kind of like a very powerful experience. So I think we need to be open to those things. These things really do happen. Connections do really start to open up when you're seriously and, and truthfully, you know, doing the practices. A lot of mysterious things can happen. And that's where we should remember and say, ah, okay. Christian, whether some whether someone wants to say the universe is listening, or someone else wants to say ah, you know, Bhagavan Sri Krishna is listening. It's the same thing, you know. That was beautiful. And I still have that book. So. <laughs> Imagine as a kid being like, whoa. Yeah, I was like ah, you know. And then my mom told me, you cannot join the Hare Krishnas. I don't care if this happened or not. You know, and I said I understand. You know, I want long hair. I can't shave my head, you know, so, so. Yeah, it's funny, while we're recording this, my, all my hair is gone. So. Right, right, I was like, I cannot, I love, I cannot give up my hair as a, as a 16, 17 year old person at this moment of time. <laughs> Just can't make you think <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at 1212 to 1214. Perseverance in pursuing self-knowledge and sincere aspiration to experience it through meditation is better than the possession of theoretical knowledge. Yeah. Bring up to me the fruits of action, moreover, is better than one-sided but restless meditation. Action, coupled with renunciation of the fruits of action, brings inner peace, which makes it possible to meditate deeply. He who bears no ill will towards anyone, who is kind and friendly to all, who has no consciousness of I or mine, who is even-minded during pain and pleasure, forgiving toward all, inwardly contented, 
steadfast in his yoga meditation practices and self-control, who tries faithfully through yoga practice to unite his soul to me, who is firm in determination and whose mind and discrimination are surrendered to me. Such a one is dear to me. And that just, you know, is if anyone has any questions, they can often, it's like, well, what is, you know, you know, I'm reading the Bhagavad Gita of what does Krishna want? And they could read that, you know, it's essentially saying like, this is what I'm asking for. And once again, then we're back to the same thing. He's saying like, listen, if, you know, really seriously trying to do, you know, meditation, that's better than just memorizing a bunch of blind knowledge. And then if you can offer up, save it as something that's even better than meditation, because sometimes you know, when he says one-sided but restless meditation, that, that's a reference that Yogananda was giving because Yogananda used to always speak of this, that he would say like when one starts doing intense tapas and intense meditation, it can cause a lot of problems, right? It can, or, or not problems, but it can cause a lot of strange things that happen in the body like kundalini disorders or mental vitiations. And so you had to be real busy working with that. You had to have a teacher and you'd have to kind of like balancing it out. It was just a lot, you know, you, which was important, but they were just saying like, listen, that's not going to be super easy either. Um, that's, you know, so if you could just kind of do action, but give up all the hope for results from it, that brings you a lot of inner peace. And when you have that inner peace, then meditation is much easier. I often think of this verse all the time when, you know, when we see in the past years, uh, you know, when the mindfulness movement got real big in America, uh, you know, and, and they were kind of, you know, that became like a buzzword, like mindfulness, mindfulness, and, and there, you know, and then what happened then after a while, of course, as everything happens in the world, what first is really cool, then everyone starts, starts to say, well, now we think it's not cool. And then people were saying like, oh, you know, meditation actually could be really dangerous because it can make you depressed and it can make you think about something that you could have these other experiences. And we, that's when we started to see these articles and like, uh, New Reader and New Yorker about all oh, the dangers of meditation and you know you shouldn't go off your med your drugs and stop seeing your psychiatrist because you went to a mindfulness workshop and you know and and that's when people had to come out and say like listen meditation is not supposed to make you happy meditation was about you know deconstructing the mind and understanding that and so kind of, there's a kind of a connection there he's saying like listen if someone's just being a good person and trying to help others with with a, with a sincere attitude meditation is going to be very easy. You know, so I, I used to often tell people if they were having very negative experiences with meditation, I would often say, how much are you helping others? How much time are you devoting to seva? Um, and because that can be very healing, it calms the mind. And then the waters of the mind are very calm and you can kind of start to journey through them as opposed to some raging storm that you're kind of like taking a ship into this raging storm and it can just be totally crazy. So there's a lot of little pearls in this verse that we can relate. Um, and then of course, someone who's kind and friendly to all, sees everyone's equal, you know, doesn't, has no, when they say has no consciousness or of I or mind, it just means they're not selfish. You know, they're doing things, not expecting to get something from it. They're just doing things to help others. Um, and then who is, you know, he, he kind of, he's kind of reiterating everything he's been saying. Someone who doesn't matter whether pleasure and pain comes, they're, they're nice to all people. Um, you know, they practice meditation and they don't overreact and they, they have faith that if they continue to do this, they'll find me. Um, those people, I really love. When, when he says that I'm, they're dear to me, then that's a, that's a kind of a, a, kind of a hint to what I was talking about last time, I believe, about that if Krishna loves you, then, then, then you're, that's it. You can't get them away. You know, they'll, they'll say so. You know, he'll say, if, if these people are dear to me, then they're like, uh oh, he's, he likes you. That means you're going to be, he's going to be asking to come over all the time, or he's just going to show up unannounced, um, or he's going to show up in all these mysterious ways. And so that's kind of saying, like, you have that magnetic pull, your love, your devotion, your sincerity just starts to draw him. And, and you become an irresistible uh, force, and he wants to be with you. That, that's how the Vaishnavas would, would describe him. I really like the statement, you know, there was a, a few areas where I focused in on heavily a few times, you know, just the, the fact of not having ill will towards people. Yes, and, yes. Uh, you know, that was, for me growing up, that was really difficult. I was a very hostile, angry thing inside for a long time in my life. 
And it wasn't until I was able to not have that ill will, regardless of what happened, that I was able to sink deeper into a, a, a yogic practice and, and a bhakti practice. Yeah, that, sure. That hate and anger inside of me, bhakti just, it, it didn't jive. It didn't fit. It didn't, I didn't have the same type of feelings that I got after that hatred and that ill will was resolved, whether justified or not. It was right, like, right, right. And and sometimes I I hypothesize in my mind that if we're a vessel to be filled with divinity, that um, it's more difficult when we smell like a sewer inside. Mm-hmm. We have stinking thinking, and the itty bitty shitty committee is just going yakety yakety yak. Why does Krishna want to hang out there? Maybe like it's kind of uh, stinky in there. And to really purify ourselves to the best of our abilities to all of those vitiations, not just vitiations, but also contaminants. Yeah. It would be like if you invited a guest over to your house and you're like, here, take a seat on the uh, chair covered in poop. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to be like, yeah. I, don't, I don't know that I want to come over and visit anymore. It's kind of dirty over here. Yeah. I, I visualize these vitiations, this even-mindedness, this um, friendliness to all in these different phrases as when we try in all earnesty to eliminate or at minimum reduce them, then we become a more nice place for him. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I always, you know, encourage people to, to ponder these verses and to really contemplate these verses because, you know, there, there are so many individuals in the world that are very caustic and very argumentative and, 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 you know, especially, you know, people who live in these, you know, realms of social media and everyone wants to argue just constantly and it becomes very toxic. And so, you know, it's always good to, to return to these ideas about, just don't focus on yourself. Try to keep treat everyone equally. Try to help as many people as you can, with you know, out of sincere reasons. Don't expect something from others. Just try to help others. Um, th- these are aspirations, right? These aren't things that we just we check off on a on a list. Like, right? okay, perfect. I've ma- I've mastered that. Okay, now on to the next thing. Okay, I've mastered that. These are these are things that always we work on all our all our lifetimes to help to refine ourselves. Um, but the more that we do these things, the more we can under we can appreciate and understand uh, the secrets of bhakti yoga. What bhakti yoga has to offer us. And I like how you talked about it earlier as being a magnetic, like attractant. It is. It is. Yeah. It's. It literally the tapas tapas, and, and agni creates of course a protective force. But it also kind of creates a magnetic pulse. I often refer to it as like a systole and diastole. It's like the heart, it pumps out, but then it, it goes back in. And so we radiate out, but then we pull things back in. Uh, and, and that's a very important thing. So we, but then we have to have the eyes to see it, the ears to hear it. We have to be aware and listen to that, you know, and not have any expectations of how that's going to show up. Yeah. You know, that's very hard. Yeah, it is. It really is hard. So let's take a look at 12.15. One who doesn't disturb others, who's not disturbed in return, who never exalts anything, and never jealous, fearful, worried, such as dear to me. And that goes along with what we were just saying. Exactly, exactly. And in 12.17 and 12.19, he who neither rejoices in good fortune nor grieves when things go wrong, who judges matters as neither good nor evil, who is devoted only to me, such a one is dear to me. He who treats friend and foe alike who is ever minded, whether receiving honor or dishonor, who calmly without attachment accepts warm and cold, pleasure and pain, who's the same under praise or censor, who is inwardly tranquil and contented, who is attached to no abode and is ever calm and devout, such is dear to me. So that, you know, really ties in with everything 
and just dovetails everything that we've been talking about as well. It's so true. Okay, so let's take a look here um, at that final verse. Is there anything else that you want to add into this textual portion? Um, it actually ends with the last verse 20, but those who filled with devotion pursue the deathless dharma I have described ever engrossed in me are above all dear to me. And when I was reading that the other day, I thought to myself, pursue the deathless dharma. Interesting idea, right? Yeah, I mean, it, at least in this translation. It may not say that in all the translations exactly, but I thought to myself, what is that? Deathless dharma. Does that mean that even after I die from this envelope that I'll still have dharma or that I'm just constantly performing my dharma? And it was kind of a brain twister for a moment. Do yeah. Any insight on, on, you know, what do they mean by pursue the deathless dharma I have described? I mean, I know that it's tied in with doing all your duties and things like that. But I thought sure, it was sure. So profound how it was stated. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a little bit of a nuance of the uh, uh, Yogananda, you know, how he likes to, you know, which he'll do some unique translations. But one of the key ideas to remember about this is that from a Vaishnava perspective, the greatest thing that they wanted to do, uh, or they would often say the greatest level of devotion was not, or was when one reached the point where one didn't even want liberation. That one, that the, all they wanted to do was to be in the presence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and just exist in perpetual worship of it. And so that's what this verse is essentially talking about. Um, the, the, you know, the, this, another Sanskrit, like a more simpler one, they would say those who are faithful and those who follow this eternal path of Dharma that I've described, considering me to be supreme, such persons are very dear to me. And those are the people that you'll see, like, that's talking about, like, a, we can talk about a little bit more esoteric angle. That would be, those are the people that reach the level of the Goloka Vrindavana realm of being. Uh, they can actually go into Vrindavana forest and, and witness the gopis, witness Krishna exist in this realm because all they want to do is just be with them. They don't want to do, you know, it's like, it's like if you love someone so much that you're like, I don't care what, I don't care where we go. I don't care what we do. As long as I can just be with you, that's all I want. You know, and you might've had, I don't know if people have ever had that feeling before, you know, or that they, all they want to do, maybe a lost child has that feeling, right? All they want to do is like, if I could just be back with my mother or my father or whoever the, you know, person was taking care of, I don't care what, I'm just going to feel safe. And so that's kind of what Krishna, they're kind of hinting at in this verse is that people who just, they don't, all they care about is worshiping me. They don't even care about anything else. They don't, they don't care about like saving themselves or stopping all their pain or reaching the, some magical level of heaven or reaching some mystical tantric level of cities that they just say, no, I just want to just be by you and just witness these eternal past pastimes of yours. And then the Krishna would say, ah, those are the people that I love the most. Those are the ones that are so, 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 so dear to me. Um, and that's, you know, and that's the high level of Raza that someone takes that and can see things at that level. And that, you know, that they'll often say like, those are the saints. When the saints had reached that level, they would see mystical visions. They would taste mystical foods. Um, all those things would happen. And, and if one was lucky enough to be around such saints, it was kind of it was kind of uh, it was kind of radioactive. It's kind of like being around radioactivity, like you're affected whether you want to or not, you know. And, and a trace of it is left in you. And then sometimes that can really shake things up for better or for worse. And then if you perpetually stay around that person, then you're just constantly exposed to the radiation, and it definitely changes you. Other times, people are just kind of shaking; they don't like it and they want to get out. Uh, but that's what anyone who can kind of exist in that kind of bliss 
Um, that's the highest highest realms of bhakti yoga is that. They don't care what they get. They don't care what they see. They don't care how they feel. They don't care what kind of body, if they have a body or not, they just want to be there and, and, and they have this love and devotion. So that's like the ultimate level of bhakti. To me, that's just so beautiful. It's a very beautiful concept. Yeah, it's a very, very mysterious concept. And once again, um, to address Leon's question, they would the Vaishnavas the Vaishnavas would say that the only way that someone could have that highest level would be if they had a personality, because if they had no personality or of some sort, if they had no self awareness of some sort then they wouldn't even know they, they were worshiping. They would, there would, there'd be no separation. And so that there, you know, that's the, that's the radical concept of a chinta beta beta tattva, simultaneous union and difference. That was the radical Vaishnava concept. It's a very important concept. It's also a very important concept in tantric physics, which I write about. Um, and I mentioned it in, in Cave of the Numinous and a lot of people didn't get that, which is fine. It's an esoteric concept. Um, but the idea is that, you know, if someone really wants to be that close, then they have to have something to be close to. And also, too, there has to be a separation, you know. But, but then at the same time, they'll say, but the love is so strong that it creates a unity that is so beautiful. But yet it's different. It's like it's, it's kind of, it, it boggles the mind. You know, it's this kind of it's like another dimensional type of physics. It, that's literally what it is. It's another dimensional level of physics. It's a physics that exists outside of, the, of our Newtonian realm. And we can see hints of that in mysterious studies on quantum physics. Is it a particle or is it a wave? It's both, depending on how, it, you know, it, depending on how they test it. Well, it can't be. It has to be this. Well, it's not. We don't know. And so it's like, it's, are, they, are they united? Are they separate? And they, they would say, they're both. <laughs> you know? And so why other schools of thought would say, no, there has to be a separation or there has to be a unity. You know, the Vaishnava would say, no, at this highest level to this level, there has to be this, this simultaneously union and difference as well. It's a very beautiful concept. Yeah, I really like how that's described. And it reminds me too of just the simplistic picture that I used to have of Radha. And she has the, always has the tear coming out of her eye. Yes, it yes, yes. Just this, you know, she's not crying because she's sad. It's this deep, deep, longing and that she just can't shake this longing it's just this uh uh-huh uh-huh and they would even have the, they would have yeah the so many like the sri govinda gita very sacred text and uh the sri gopi gita these texts they would have whole descriptions of these states like that like when radha was was could not be with krishna she was going insane with with jealousy with madness with desperation with craving and then you know her gopi assistants would come say listen i went and talked to krishna he you know i scolded him he's on his way and then and radha would be like what is taking him so long you know and so but they would say in that waiting period when she was waiting for him to come could, could be even more powerful than when they were together right and then it's, it starts to get, you start to get into these riddles you're like wait what I thought it was better to be together than, and then sometimes they say, well, no, sometimes the joy, it, the, the longing is so intense because of the separation. And then other times it was because of the union and other times it was because she was controlling of him that she could control him. That's what she needed. Other times he controlled. So it's very mysterious. They were talking about all these, the, these shades of love that you would experience at these higher levels um, could really be kind of, it's some really kind of can riddle a mind that, it, that thinks it has to be only one way or, you know, there has to be a really easy ending. They would say, well, maybe, maybe not, you know, so. Really powerful energy happens there. Yeah, it's very mysterious. All right, so let's go ahead and close this segment. And then we'll move on to question, answer, some discussion. And yeah, it's already 3.06. That's crazy. That time went by very quickly. Yeah.